Hi, I'm Fox Sellers, and today we're going to be looking at Alfred Hitchcock films. This is my channel dedicated to storytelling. If you fancy fables, fiction, tall tales, and high adventure, then I'm your dude, dude. If you would, click the like, click the subscribe. You'll be alerted to videos that I do in the future, and also comment below. It's fun. So if you've seen my director's video, you'll know, and this is no spoiler, but Alfred Hitchcock is near the top of the list, of course. Hitchcock is best known for his suspense thrillers, of course, but he's also, he's, he's a master at characters, misdirection, tension building, dialogue, entertaining perspective, and, and like, he's an utter genius at composition and photography. These are my 11 favorite Alfred Hitchcock films from worst to best. Some of my honorable mentions that, that uh, just fell short of the top 11 are behind me. There's Dial M for Murder. There's Rope, which is that film where he, it's almost like a play where he tried to film it as if it was all one shot. Uh, just didn't make the top 11. I Confess, which I believe is one of his more underrated films, is starring Montgomery Cliff as a priest who discovers uh, a murderer during like a confessional. Um, but he's bound by the secrecy of his faith. Uh, and God and the principles of his devotion to the church, not to divulge the murderer to the police, even though like at some point he's he's a he's a suspect. Just short of 11 for me is Vertigo, which uh, I'm sure is going to aggravate a lot of people. It's it's most people's favorite of all of the Hitchcock movies. I I absolutely love it, too. It, it's pure cinema and, and it's it, it just it just fell just below 11. Um, and the others were just a little bit better for me. So let's get right into it. Here's number 11, Notorious. This is one of the four Hitchcock films starring Cary Grant and one of the three with Ingrid Bergman. I, I'm new to this one because I, I did just buy the Criterion Collection version of this or, you know, sometime last year. And, and uh, I, I got sucked into it pretty, pretty quick. So this has honestly some of the best tension in any of Hitchcock's films, Ingrid Bergman's character, she's been recruited by like a U.S. agent and that's played by Cary Grant's character. And she needs to infiltrate a Nazi group because she's the daughter of a convicted Nazi spy. Now, one of her father's friends, who is like this wealthy chemical company owner or executive or something like that, he's always been smitten with her ever since she was little. Thus, the reason for the U.S. secret agent choosing her you know he's he believes she's best suited to spy on his actions the main macguffin in this case is the special uranium ore they are mining and he has it stored in his wine cellar Cary grant starts to fall in love with her during the whole thing meanwhile he has to watch her woo her father's friend who proposes and then you have like the moment after of her almost being discovered as a spy for, you know, a secret. It just, there's tension that goes both ways. And there's also mixed feelings by Cary Grant. Now, the uranium is a perfect example of what he coined the phrase as a MacGuffin, which um, I believe he invented, or I, I don't want to say he invented, he popularized the phrase it's debatable, you know, it depends on who you ask, but Hitchcock is credited with coining the phrase that, you know, best describes any object that's driving the plot and, and driving the desires of the characters that move that story along. The method has, of course, been around, you know, since the Arthurian legend of the Holy Grail, probably before that, to be honest with you, but you get his contribution to the thought process and the application of it here. And of course, Lucas used it in Star Wars. Spielberg used it in Raiders of the Lost Ark. It's in the title of the movie. Uh, the briefcase in Pulp Fiction. Well, you know, it, uh, it's obvious. Hitchcock has this lasting impact on the greatest directors that followed him. Now, this one was originally a, a David Zelnick production, but 
and and they did a whole bunch of movies together. But I, I believe there might have been some sort of falling out between him and Hitchcock. So Hitchcock ended up producing and directing this as well. He just didn't have the the official credit of producing, even though he ended up producing it. Um, and I don't believe Zelnick ever produced another movie with Hitchcock after this. Number 10 is Strangers on a Train. Uh, this is iconic. As a kid, I saw Throw Mama from the Train um, before I saw this. So it it was already ingrained in pop culture for me before seeing this, the origin of the, the pop culture that it represented. Of course, the premise to Strangers Meet. Would you like to have someone in their lives out? Yes, unbeknownst to the protagonist, though, like the man pitching these ideas of swapping murders, the guy's dead serious, and he didn't realize it. Each fellow does the other fellow's murder, then there's nothing to connect them. Each one has murdered a total stranger, like you do my murder. This is one of the quintessential Hitchcock murder suspense films. Number nine is Rear Window. Rear, you know, here's the thing. Rear Window grew on me. I probably had a lot of other honorable mentions ahead of this originally. Um, but each time I did see this movie, I got something new out of it. And I admit, I may have shortchanged it originally. So, like, you know, upon further viewing, it, it just became more and more solidified. Another one of those concepts that's now like a staple in pop culture since it's been remade and had variations of it and like, oh, Christ Christopher Reeve starred in a remake and he was, you know, was a legitimate paraplegic after his accident, of course. And it's, it's most striking characteristic is the immobility you feel as a viewer who has a limited view of the surroundings. You're cooped up and you're in a limited space but you have the short range peripheral of the apartment complex and the view of like all your neighbors from your window. But it's through this restrictive lens of a pair of binoculars. And, you know, as a writer, it, it is a fun exercise in expanding your creativity slash imagination with some appropriate restrictions that, that are, you know, laid upon you. This is the first film on the list that uh, Alfred Hitchcock was nominated for Best Director. And you know what? I almost feel like there's elements of himself that are in this film, you know, because he was an expert with the lens. He was He's an expert in photography. He admired a lot of the leading ladies that he directed in films. So he has that aspect of like seeing things from afar and either admiring them or experiencing them. And he masterfully understands the perspective and how it changes based on your vantage point and the lens that you look through. Number eight is The Trouble with Harry. All right, let's take a little detour here because this one is a comedy. All of his other movies are suspense, thrillers, horrors, you know, what, whatever you want to call it, romances. This one is a straight up comedy and he executes it absolutely perfectly. Hmm, perhaps I'll come back tomorrow. When's that? Day after today. That's yesterday, today's tomorrow. It was. When was tomorrow yesterday, Mr. Morrow? Today. Oh, sure. Yesterday. Picture, if you will, the Norman Rockwell-esque New England town. Everyone knows everybody else. It's like it's kind of like Bayberry and multiple people stumble across this dead body on a hilltop. <laughs> so, and the, and the kicker here, almost every single one of them believe they accidentally killed this guy. And avoid. I, I want to avoid a play-by-play -play for each of the characters. You know, the, the most amusing of all the characters that that stumble across this body is the little boy who thinks that he killed him with a toy gun. And this, of course, is Jerry Mathers from Leave It to Beaver. He's adorable, and he's truly the. I, I believe he's the probably the most prominent driving comedic force in this film because of his lovability. I will add that with moving the body around and getting it propped up and, and you know, it falling and, and there's these noticeable predicaments that they get caught up in. It's an obvious influence on Weekend at Bernie's. Uh, I, of course, I, I love this one far more than I like Weekend at Bernie's, but you, you get the, the connection between the two. Number seven is North by Northwest. 
So now, even though this one is a suspense thriller, I absolutely love the adventure aspect of this. Going from place to place, and then, fi- you know, it finally ends up in this big, thrilling climax at Mount Rushmore. It's a top-tier Cary Grant film. Honestly, everybody knows North by Northwest. Say no more. Number six is Suspicion. Now, here's another Cary Grant vehicle. Joan Fontaine plays the role she's best known for, you know, the, the, <laughs> the mousy victim caught up in something she's not quite able to maneuver through. Um, so, so much so, she won an Oscar for her performance in this. It's the first film on the list that was nominated for Best Picture. This film is loaded with ambiguity. Grant's character is kind of a slime ball. He's he's about he's a penniless gambling addict. There's like suspicions of him, you know, embezzling the murder. All of the list of like the concerning things that you might suspect about him kind of just builds up. And as a viewer, you're not quite sure what's what's the deal with this dude. And the thing is, like, you get very invested in Joan Fontaine's character where you're like, come on, I just just dump this loser already, would you? And it, it, almost to the point where, like, it's the classic horror movie where, like, you know, the, the characters decide, hey, I got an idea. Let's go down in the basement. You're like, no, don't go down in the basement. And yet she continues to, to be with this guy again and again. Oh, my God, you're being a fool. Number five, Shadow of a Doubt. This one stars Joseph Cotton, Teresa Wright. And Teresa Wright, you know, I feel like she had a pretty big impact. Uh, You know, when I first saw this movie, I do remember being very struck by her performance. And and I wanted to see more of her films after this movie. So she really was one of the best driving vehicles to make this movie what it was. Now, Hitchcock is quoted as saying this was one of his most enjoyable films to make. Not to, not to say he was his favorite film or anything. He just, you know, he really liked the people he worked with and everything that went on on the set. It's simple, but yet perfectly crafted is how I would like to describe it. It was almost like a Twilight Zone episode, you know, had that kind of feel to it. And and while not being too fantastical or like science fiction-y, if that's a word, it also had like this middle America down home apple pie feel to it. It, it. Almost like kind of, you know, an episode of Leave it to Beaver or The Adventures of Ozzie and Harriet. You know, I, I can't quite explain like how a film like this is as simple as it is, yet as great as it is. And I, I, don't know, I, I can't picture a world where this movie doesn't exist. It, it would be like living in an alternate universe where like there's no such thing as like It's a Wonderful Life or, or Superman or, or Sherlock Holmes. Or even like Dickens, A Christmas Carol. Like, it's just so iconic. You can't imagine a world without this film existing in it. Number four is Spellbound. Ingrid Bergman shows up again, and this time she's with Gregory Peck. And he did two films with Gregory Peck, but this is the this is the one that really shines. I would have loved to have seen more Gregory Peck in his films. You know, he's he's one of my favorite actors. So this this one was nominated for Best Picture. And also Best Director. It's crazy that he never won an Oscar for Best Director. And he was nominated a couple times, but you know, never won. This had six Oscar nominations, and it won for Best Musical Score. Miklos Rasha, who had also he, you know, he won for like Ben Hur, and he he worked with Billy Wilder a lot on Double Indemnity and his Sherlock Holmes movie. He was a huge influence on Jerry Goldsmith, who came later. Uh, I almost want to say he was underrated but he wasn't you know he was a highly recognized and esteemed uh musician in in the film industry so um there you have it i can't make out just what sort of a place it was this is more of a psychological thriller it it digs deep into the the psychoanalysis of dreams and the psychological impact of drama and it your upbringing and Salvador Dali was involved with the development of like the the dream sequences throughout the film. Yeah, you know, I actually haven't seen Spellbound in in a, in a bit of a spell. Uh, so I think by the making of this video alone, I, I, I'm inspired to kind of pull it out and, and watch it again. You know, just because of my fond memories of originally watching it. 
Number three is The Lady Vanishes. The Lady Vanishes, this one is my kind of wild horse entry. Be, you know, I, and I, I, I love this movie. It, it follows a young English woman. She's like traveling Europe by train. She meets an elderly woman who later, she kind of just disappears. She, she, you know, during the early stages of the trip. Multiple interesting characters on the train all claim the woman never existed. So, so this is like gaslighting 10 years before the phrase ever even existed. And, you know, of course, the movie Gaslight didn't come out until the 40s. So the English lady, where is she? There has been no English lady here. There's lots of really interesting characters that are questioned. And it's really a great exercise in character development and ensemble composition of characters. It has some fantastic plot twists where you'll find yourself asking like, well, how do we get here? And, you know, based on where we were just a minute ago and, and so much doubt about the validity to each of the facts that are presented. Cause you just, you're really confused as to like, all right, what the hell's going on? I know you think I'm crazy, but I'm not, I'm not. Hitchcock developed a lot of his films based on the the latest big hit novel. And he either, like, it was either like a huge hit or it was a, a book that he recently read that he loved. And The Lady Vanishes was from, you know, the best-selling novel, The Wheel Spins. And I believe they made, you know, several versions of it that came before and after Hitchcock's version. Number two is Psycho. This is a lot of people's number one. It's a lot of people's number one horror. And certainly a lot of people's favorite Hitchcock film. Um, you know, one of the most significant contributions to cinema is, is this film. And enough can be said just about the film alone. Uh, I'd like, you know, I, I think I kind of want to talk about some of the, the technique that he had developed. You know, I'll, I'll point out like the Dolly zoom effect. You know, it was first used, I, I think, in Vertigo um, in beautifully used, of course. Spielberg brought interest back into it when he did Jaws. You know, and of course it's done with a dolly. That's where it, where it gets its name. But, you know, by keeping it aligned with the foreground, you can disorient the viewer by distorting the perspective. And the dude is just inventing techniques. I mean, thus, you know, a pioneer in the industry by definition. Hitchcock is also notable for his evolving relationship with like the musical scores in his film. During like the golden age of cinema, they had evolved into this like big thematic themes, which would either like keep the pace or add a comedic rhythm or like entertain separately as a beautiful piece of music. Now, Bernard Herrmann's score for, you know, he did, he did Psycho, was an example of using the music to hit very dramatic cues. You know, it's, it's almost like I feel like Hitchcock was taking a page right out of Tom and Jerry's musical score playbook. Its impact changed the way music was used in film. And my number one favorite Alfred Hitchcock film is Rebecca. Imagine seeing 20 plus films from a director as great as Hitchcock and then seeing his best film. It was my favorite film from the very first moment I saw it, I was already, you know, I was already a huge Hitchcock fan, uh, but this one kind of like cemented him as like one of the greatest. I did just read the book, um, you know, about a year and a half ago. I loved it. Both the book and the film are marvelous for like their own reasons and their differences make them great based on their own merit. I felt like the book which of course was more detailed, um, but it was more beautiful with respect to like detailing Manderley. The book portrays Max in a kinder light in the movie, you know, Laurence Olivier, he's, he's not likable really at all. So that's one kind of like a big difference. And, and that gives the book a one up. Um, Rebecca is more sinister as a character in the book, even though you never meet her. She's already dead at the beginning of the, the start of the story, but she is the topic of every single conversation throughout the entire story, whether the book, the movie, you know, whatnot. However, the film, Mrs. Danvers is so much more menacing and frightful. Do you think the dead come back and watch the living? I don't, I don't believe it. 
Sometimes. I wonder if she doesn't come back here to Manderley. Watch you and Mr. De Winter together. Rebecca's cousin, uh, Favel, is, he's, he's just awful in the book. Like, he's really just, I don't want to say he's not likable. He's not likable, but he's, th- that's not the point of him. It, it's just that the guy was such a scumbag in the book. And, and I didn't get that impression in the movie. And I feel like that was kind of a nice change. The performance by George Sanders in the film, he provides more of a, a ambiguity to this character. You're not quite sure what's this guy's angle, what's going on. And that allows you to be a little more invested in him and what what's the deal. You, it's almost like when someone kind of whispers and you have to lean forward to hear what they're saying. The application of George Sanders' performance as Favel is is like that. And I and I and I like that. And he's got he's got likability, he's charming, he's cunning enough to where, where you want to like sympathize or even like question the clues about Rebecca's death. And then as far as like the visuals go, I mean, of course, this is a movie, so visuals are paramount. But in the book, they kind of slow roll the displayed patient overview of everything that it's describing visually, um, which is beautiful. It's so beautiful. It's it's wonderful. It's just it's it's a different pace, of course. Um, in the in the movie, the imagery is condensed, and it's much much more impactful. In the scenes, you know, of, of course, it's, it's a movie, so it's a short amount of time. But, I, you know, without spoiling the end, for, uh, for those of you that haven't seen it or read the book, of course, um, it's, its ending has this implied ending, which Hitchcock's film displays perfectly. And there's no ambiguity about it. Like, that's what was assumed in the book. And here's the visual of the horrific ending. I much more prefer the film's ending as it was done than the books. Um, but the book is just entirely wonderful on its own merits. And honestly, the, the, the fact of the matter is Rebecca is my favorite Hitchcock film. It's maybe my top 20 or 30 favorite films, period. Uh, I, I, I give it a watch probably every year. So I'm hoping that if any of you are Hitchcock fans and that was not at the top of your list, you may maybe give it a second watch because it is an utter masterpiece. And that is my top 11 Alfred Hitchcock videos from worst to best. I want to thank you for watching all the way to the end. If you would, click like. Also, su- click subscribe if you would. You'll be alerted to more of my videos in the future. Thanks again for watching. I'm Foxy Sellers.